operational wing command of the organization. Ryan would give anything for a shot at Al Qatani. Roki was no Al Qatani, but wandering around France, so far from his normal area of operations, he was certainly interested. On the whim, Jack clicked open a folder on his desktop that contained a subfolder on each and every terrorist, suspected terrorist, cutout, etc. This was not the database used by the intelligence community at large. Virtually all federal agencies used the TIDE, the Terrorist Identities Data Mark environment. Ryan had access to this massive file system, but he found it unwieldy and populated with way too many nobodies to be of any use to him. He referred to the TIDE when he was building his own folder, or Rose Gallery as he called it, but only for specific information on specific subjects. Most of the rest of the data for his rogues gallery was his own research, with odds and ends added on by his fellow analysts here at the campus. It was a tremendous amount of work, but the effort itself had already paid dividends. As often as not, Jack found himself not needing to check his folder, because in the preparation of the files, he had committed the vast majority of this information to memory, and he allowed himself to forget a tidbit of intel only once the man or woman had been confirmed dead by multiple reliable sources. But since Roki was not a rock star, Ryan did not remember all of the man's specs. So he clicked on Hosni Roki's folder, took a look at the pictures of his face, scrolled down the data sheet, and confirmed what he already knew. As far as any Western intelligence agency was aware, Roki had never been to hear him. Jack then opened the folder about Abu bin Muhammad out of the time. There was only one picture on file. It was a few years old, but the resolution was good. Jack didn't bother reading the data sheet on this guy because Jack had written it himself. No Western intelligence agency had known anything about Al Qatani until after the capture and interrogation of the Emir. Once the man's name and occupation passed the Emir's lips, Ryan and the other analysts at the campus went to work piecing together the history of the man. Jack himself took the lead of the project, and it was something he couldn't take much pride in, since the information they'd managed to compile after a year of work was so bad and thin. Al-Qatani had always been camera and media shy, but he became incredibly elusive after the disappearance of the Emir. Once they knew who he was, he seemed to just drop off the map. He'd stayed in the dark for the past year, until last week, that is, when fellow campus analyst Tony Wills uncovered a quoted posting on a jihadist website claiming Al-Qatani had called for reprisals against European nations, namely France, for passing laws outlawing the wearing of burqas and headscarves. The campus distributed that intel, overtly of course, back out to the intelligence community at large. Ryan connected the dots such as they were. The head of URC Ops was to strike out in France, and within a week, a junior achiever in the organization shows up in the country, apparently to meet with others. Tenuous. Tenuous at best. Certainly not something that would normally make Ryan move operators to the area. Under normal circumstances, after this sighting, he and his co-workers would just make a point of monitoring French intelligence feeds and CIA Paris station traffic to see if anything else developed during Hosni Roki's European vacation. But Ryan knew Clark and Chavez were in Frankfurt just a quick hop away. Further, they were geared up and ready to go for a surveillance hop. 